So, I think without further ado, um, I will hand over to Alex and Iva, um, who will have about 10 minutes to talk us through their reflections um, on uh, grief and bereavement during this time, and hopefully set the scene for uh, the rest of the agenda. So, Alex and Iva, over to you. Oh, thanks, Iona. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Alex Evans. I'm the founder of the Collective Psychology Project, um, which published This Too Shall Pass, the report that I only just mentioned. Just to introduce the project to you, if you haven't come across us, um, the Collective Psychology Project is really about the feedback loops, if you like, between our states of mind and the state of the world. And the issue that we've worked on most since we were founded um, in 2018 is political polarization, especially around Brexit and how we can use psychology to prompt more of us to see ourselves as part of a larger us rather than a them and us, or indeed an atomized I. But what we've been working on more recently is COVID-19 um, and exploring how some of the ideas we've been working with are relevant to that. Because COVID-19 is obviously a crisis with lots of different layers. There's a public health emergency, there's an economic crisis, there's a kind of cultural and social and institutional crisis, but maybe most of all, it's a psychological crisis. Um, the World Economic Forum has actually called it the world's biggest psychological experiment. And one of the ideas we talk about is that there are almost these kind of, I call them the four psychological horsemen of the COVID apocalypse. There's a loneliness, boredom, anxiety, and grief. And grief is maybe the kind of most complicated because our society, as we know, is not great at grief at the best of times. I mean, we, we have a lot of taboos around the idea of grief. It's something we're often uncomfortable expressing in public. Um, and in particular, you know, it, it, extraordinarily, when you look at the last um, manual of uh, mental disorders, DSM-5 as it's called, it actually said that grief that lasts longer than just a few weeks is abnormal, even a pathology. So this is the extent to which we see grief as something that we just have to sort of rush through process as quickly as possible and move on. And of course, in the real world, grief isn't like that. And one of the ideas we explore in the report, This Too Shall Pass, which by the way, if you'd like to read it, it's on our website at collectivepsychology.org, is that there are these three different levels at which grief um, is playing out at the moment. One is the level that Ion has already referred to, which is the kind of personal level that we're all of us in, in different ways coping with the loss of people we care about very much in the knowledge that they probably died alone rather than you know with us at their bedsides and also that then we can't mourn in the way that we would wish to that funerals are taking place in conditions of lockdown and social isolation so that's one level at a second level of course there's grief for what's happening for the extent of loss globally i mean i looked at the global death count this morning and it stands at 252 thousand lives lost from COVID-19. Those are just the people that show up in the official counts. And of course, as we know, there's a lot more deaths than that showing up in kind of national statistics and so forth. And it's very possible, likely even, that the overall death count is likely to be well in excess of a million when all is said and done. So that's another level of grief. And then at a more meta level, there's the process of grieving for the passing of a way of life, if you like, because we've all been sitting here during lockdown waiting for things to go, quotes, back to normal. And it's gradually sinking in on all of us that many things are not going to go back to normal in the way that they were before. Um, you know, when we have emerged from lockdown, we will see how many of the kind of, you know, daily landmarks of our lives, things like shops and cafes, are gone for good. Lots of jobs are gone for good. And lots of students will be graduating school or university without ever having had the chance to say goodbye to people they've spent years with. So there's all of that loss as well, which also evokes um, emotions. So, you know, we have this kind of multi-tiered cataclysm really unfolding that's both personal and collective and that really hits head on our discomfort with grief um, and the fact that we're especially uncomfortable with doing it collectively uh, and in public. So that's really Oops, sorry, I'm muted. That's really our starting point on this report. But our jump off point is that although we think that this is an unprecedented situation, nothing like this has ever happened before, that actually human history is full of cataclysms like this, when everything we thought we know is falling apart and we're confronted with loss on multiple fronts. And that actually, when we look further back, our ancestors have a lot 
of wisdom to teach us about how to navigate moments like this. So I'm going to stop speaking there and then hand over to Iva, who's my co-author on the report, um, who's going to talk about some of the lessons that we surfaced um, from that experience. Iva, over to you. Thank you, Alex. Um, yeah, so to kind of pick up that thread, um, the, the thing that kind of comes around um, when thinking about kind of grief on all these kind of layers, um, I think is first acknowledging that this kind of this particular crisis, you know, will to, to some extent end, you know, the, the, the return of something and the emergence of something else is going to happen. Um, and I think the space for grief is uh, a kind of fundamental element to this in terms of how we kind of uh, uh, acknowledge and kind of uh, um, use grief as a necessary component of that transition and and to kind of uh, to, to allow us to process what's been going on. So the way that we've done this in the report is without trying to be sort of too actionable or trying to kind of jump to conclusions as to like, how best to, to, to kind of uh, use grief. Um, we kind of summarized, yeah, eight lessons really. I'll kind of go through them at a high level. Um, but the report obviously goes into more detail. And I guess the, the, the kind of the useful thing that I think is the kind of most provocative almost is that we have to kind of embrace grief. Um, that we kind of have to, uh, in terms of the psychological models that, that kind of come around, the kind of Kubler-Ross model is the kind of classic one, which I think almost everyone has an idea, these kind of five stages of grief that you move through. Like, and as Alex alluded to, like, you know, grief is so, so, so much more um, fluid and dynamic. And um, this idea, if we can uh, accept grief as happening, um, it allows us to then move, it, uh, move through it. And part of that, the second one is really not acknowledging that it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, this kind of, it's also kind of trackable, the idea of the, the honeymoon stage of solidarity and hope that we might have with the rise of the COVID group, uh, mutual aid groups. And then we kind of fall into this kind of bit of a trough of disillusionment. We start to feel very exhausted, you know, fatigue sets in, especially with the lockdown. People start to feel very abandoned. And this is a kind of a movement that we we're, we're almost certainly going to move through and, and grief has that kind of element to it. Uh, and in terms of the report and this work, you know, it's, it's contextualized by this idea that there's more of this kind of stuff to come. You know, the, the lockdown and COVID is kind of, you know, conveniently displaced the fact that there's a climate breakdown occurring around the globe and, and the kind of collective grief that many communities around the world are already experiencing when it comes to climate um, is an expression of that. And that's something that we have to kind of grapple with as a society, particularly in the West, where we're not so hit by it. Um, and that exposes the fourth lesson, which is to really expose that, you know, grief and death in themselves is not an equalizer. Um, it really kind of exposes the, and, and creates new forms of inequality. Um, and grief and bereavement are no less kind of prone to, to social injustice than, than anything else. And I think that um, uh, uh, can be quite clear with the organizations you all represent. Um, but saying that, like the... the, the the powerful things, the, the broader things that can come out of this, which is that the idea that we need to do this together. Um, to grieve by ourselves is a, is a very kind of powerfully damaging experience. Um, it's by definition a relational experience. And so societies and communities and groups who can mourn together, you know, have far, far more powerful resilience when it comes to coping with the, the pain and the, the, the loss of things. And so, as, as Alex said, like we, we feel that there's lots to be learned from how our ancestors grieved. If you, th if you ask a question like, you know, when someone died, how did your great grandmother deal with it? You know, you can start to understand like everyone has their own, every culture has their own way of doing it. Huge, deep history. It's, it's as old as civilization. So there's a whole kind of uh, treasure uh, of, of things that we can, we can use um, to help us with this kind of collective grief. But at the same time, we can invent new rituals. We can in invent new practices. They can have the clap for carers as a, phenomenon is a really interesting one like you know there's a, there's a new ritual that we created almost spontaneously from other countries and that points to something that we can kind of build on um but lastly that you know that loss and grief and bereavement are a natural part of life it's a natural part of the cycle 
um, if we if we take out the kind of mechanistic worldview of kind of things being broken or fixed, but understand that there's a flow to things being in states of renewal, um, that we can start to understand that life, you know, is a single natural process, is always in motion, always in flux, and that grief and mourning and loss are a, a, a natural, essential part of that. And so that's a that, that can help us in a way think of it in a positive framing, but understand that this is always going to happen. And so how can we work with that? So those are the eight um, uh, uh, lessons. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to f finish with, Alex? No, I think that's great. Thanks, Ava. Yeah, thank you very much to you both for that. Um, you'll have seen that Alex dropped in the, uh, the link to the full report um, uh, in the chat box and we'll make sure that it's circulated uh, in the notes after this. You'll also have seen it perhaps in the email that uh, we sent out this morning, um, which is the weekly Tuesday email. For anyone who's not signed up to that list, it's because you haven't signed up to the coalition. Do drop me an email or directly to hello at connectioncoalition.org.uk to get yourself on that list. It's a scintillating weekly update of lots of things around connection, both in the news, uh, things that organisation members are doing and that you can get involved with, um, and lots of other connection stuff. So um, that leaves us um, onto the sort of meaty practical stuff. So these three wonderful people um, have very kindly given up some of their time and they are on the front line of meeting the kind of community and individual needs um, that their organisations lead on. Um, as I said earlier, we're going to be starting with Andy Langford, who you might also know uh, uh, from some really good public writing he does. He published an article yesterday on uh, the crisis and what crews are doing. Um, and he's going to talk us through some basic principles. I say basic, um, like it's that simple, but some of his starting principles for how to approach grief and bereavement. Um, we'll then, as I say, have Susie on the kind of ch children's element of this and then Poppy on the rituals. Um, and I've spelt Poppy's name wrong, apologies. So, Andy, Without further ado, over to you. Sure. Thanks so much, Iona. And um, thanks, Alex and Ivan, for that. that I found it something really, really helpful. Um, I do appreciate everyone on this call, really. It's, it's, it's just great to be involved and on here and everyone um, sort of working together for this. Um, just in thinking about starting off around what evidence tells us about what people um, need at this time, um, the, the word that I would use to describe that is it's, uh, it's, it's incomplete. And what I mean by that is that, as is often the case with evidence, you're constantly building and you're building, you're, you're bringing building blocks together and trying to understand how different trends and different sorts of functions fit together. And a lot of what we can learn actually from, from, from how best to cope with where we are now is, as was um, talked about just in those last 10 minutes, is actually looking at history, is looking at also other cultures and other parts of the world. So what we're experiencing now in the UK is, is we would be fair to say, unprecedented for, for us collectively um, in these current generations. But actually, we've got lots of learning within our society because other people have been through really, really difficult situations where there have been things like um, war, which has been survived, where there's been things like mass migration, and thus loss of culture and loss of identity, loss of home. Um, and also uh, where people have been involved in, in things like famine, uh, which, is, which has prompted mass death. And so throughout the world, there, there have been incidences where we can draw sort of similar learning. And, and, then, and of course, sadly, with each of those instances, it's, it's uh, tragic situations. But we can draw some learning from it. And what we're, what we're sort of finding as well is there's another sort of body of evidence that we can draw from, which is, which is also sadly quite recent, and that's been the um, recent, uh, relatively recent, sort of spate of um, what we'd call major incidents, or traumatic incidents that have happened over the last decade. Um, most recent being things like what happened in 2017 in the summer around, um, uh, firstly in, in, in Westminster with the attack, and then the, um, the um, Old Grenfell and also uh, London Bridge, sort of Borough Market, Manchester bombings, uh, Finsbury Park Mosque. And whilst we're seeing these incidents, um, obviously 
you know, the, not as many people, there's not as many fatalities in those. What we see is, is a trend towards how people perceive and cope with their loss and their grief in those. Um, and what we sort of tend to see with that is that people develop what's called traumatic responses, very broadly, and, and, and that can be broad. Um, but that is sort of very loosely around when people find that the, what they're experiencing in their loss can, is, is starkly different from what they might perceive to be normal in inverted commas. We're often talking about what normal or new normal is around this, aren't we? We've already sort of used those words in these past few minutes. Um, but actually something that our brain finds really difficult to, to process. And if, if, if the death of someone close wasn't difficult enough as it is, then it's made it more difficult. And that's when these sort of certain things can arise for us. So what we broadly find is that, is that, being in this environment where there's grief and there's also potential for trauma, what can be helpful is, um, is, is something that, we, that isn't normally ad, um, advocated in the, in, the, in the therapeutic world, actually, it was, is, is more of a clinical response earlier on. And when I'm talking about that, what I mean is that, is that actually um, a really, really good um, interaction and a a good helping conversation early on with someone who can support an individual who's grieving. And that doesn't need to be a support service. In fact, um, what is, is really, really helpful is people broadly knowing how to speak to someone when they're experiencing this type of bereavement. Um, but it can be really, really important to have that conversation earlier on. Um, and what we, what we find broadly in situations of trauma is that if a conversation about how someone's feeling, how they're coping, who they're linked into, do they need any other support, um, how is their mood at the moment, and do they see a way uh, into the future, do they have a sense of hope at all? Um, and then they can talk relatively openly with that. That if that conversation happens earlier on, then that can really, really help people down the line. Um, it's, whilst it's important, it's, it's been important in the past with other types of bereavements and other situations, um, it's even more important now. And you know, what the estimates would be is that if, if we don't have those conversations that earlier on with people who are grieving, then, then they'll, they'll experience grief all the more powerfully later on as well as now. And so it's important to know what to sort of include in that, really. Um, the, the, the other thing I just noticed as well around it is that when we're talking about grief in relation to, to COVID-19, what we've started talking about more in crews is around actually grief in the, in the context of a global pandemic. Because uh, everyone is affected by this. So... I certainly know people professionally and personally who've been bereaved through um, uh, directly through COVID-19. And I know people who've experienced grief and have lost someone um, in, a, in a death that is not related to COVID-19 at all. But they're experiencing their grief differently. And as we've already talked about just in these last few minutes is around how um, things like we can't observe the usual rituals we'd have set up and that would be available to us. You know, if, we, if, if, if they weren't so important to us, maybe what was was actually getting a really good hug from someone who we care for um, and who, who we know loves us. Well, actually, that might not be possible now, um, or it might be limited. Uh, meeting up with people isn't possible face-to-face -face in the same way, and we use platforms like this. Um, and so, and so that's, that's, there's this difference there, which is uh, not just for any COVID-19 related bereavement, but for everyone who's experiencing grief at this point in time. And I think that's really, really important. But certainly we found it important for us to remember in Cruise. And I think it's important for us to continue remembering as, as, as we go, um, because that will echo throughout, not just for now, but for when, the, when any restrictions are lifted, people will still be experiencing um, and remembering what they've experienced now. So 
In terms of, I'm sure I've, there's many, many points I have <laughs> hoped to call or record in this brief time. Um, in terms of what, what is, what sort of three principles to really um, remember around approaching grief and bereavement at this point. Um, and the first one to remember, we, you know, we think is that, is that grief is different at different times. Now, that is the case, uh, that was the case before the lockdown, before COVID-19. It, it will be now and it will be, it will be afterwards. Um, so even as we make um, statements in this, in this call about what we think will happen or what evidence tells us, um, I'm certainly making them now, what we, what we need to hold alongside those is that everyone's experience is subjective and really very different. Um, and it will be different as well for different deaths that we experience. You know, I might lose someone um, this week, but then in two weeks' time, if I experience another bereavement, how I feel about those two may well be very, very different, and one may compound the other. Or I might not actually feel anything at all at this point. It might come up later. Um, and so it's worth bearing in mind that that, that process uh, isn't concrete. And it also, um, you know, as, as, as was said in, um, just by the previous speakers there, it's not linear. So we don't experience one feeling and then another and then another and then another set of thoughts and then it eventually passes. It's messier than that. Um, and it's subjective and it's more like a constellation of thoughts, feelings, and what we know more about now is, as, as physical sensations um, that are really important to bear in mind. They'll be different for different people at different times. Certainly what we're experiencing more on the, on the helpline now, people calling, and amongst things that they're talking about, as well as feeling anguish, as well as um, saying that they feel grief, that they're actually experiencing physical sensations like, like intense pain, you know, headaches, backache, stomach ache, those types of things. Um, that you can associate with that grief. The second thing is that is that once again there is a there's a backdrop of of um, of loss. You know, so um, if you tune, if you see the radio on TV on social media, there's there's, there's COVID nineteen all over really. Um, and what we've certainly been talking with people about uh, and organisations about is is how they perhaps help people and support people to manage how much exposure to that type of material they get and how they balance that with you know, wanting to be informed and needing to be informed about what's going on in the world and in the local communities, whilst at the same time balancing what they can do for self-care and also where their hope might lie. So it's trying to take all of that in, in view, really. Um, and ultimately, not, not in a harsh way, we would say it's, that's actually about proactively taking responsibility for our own well-being in what is a very difficult situation. So that's important. Um, and also taking some responsibility uh, for each other. And that will get me on to my third point, really, about social contact being vital. So, you know, personally, I'd be happy to share is that I love meeting with people face to face. You know, I, I, think, I think platforms like this it are an incredible blessing. And equally, it's, it's, it's also no substitute for me personally. Um, but also, we have to hold that. We realise that, um, that, that what we have is what we've got at the moment and actually to use what we've got. Certainly, many of the conversations we're having with people um, coming into our services is, is around encouraging, where possible, to identify who can support them, who they can link into, um, who they feel they can trust with what they disclose. And then also... How do they get in contact and stay in contact with those people? Um, and that's really important. It's very important for this context. But we see a rise in, you know, in, in that chronic loneliness we've been able to identify. But also the hope in the prospect that, that, that through those social connections that can continue to be made, there can be some hope in that. You know, that there, there can be reconnections made um, through, through things like, like sort of web-based platforms, through people picking up the telephone again, through simple expressions of compassion, like delivering shopping to people that, that are just really, really so very practical. I can't tell you the number of calls we, we take every, every week that, that really move from a position of people disclosing such intense emotion, but then moving to something very practical about, about, okay, what do you need for you now? Who can you ask? 
or it might be around actually if you're supporting someone now what practically can you do to help them and it might be a simple call it might be a card in the post it might be the delivery of, of, of something on the doorstep and um, i would just budge in a third principle really or a third overall a fourth, fourth sorry overarching um, thing really which is we work with you know last year crews worked with over 150 organizations to to help train them in working with their customers or clients um, and also working with their volunteers and staff over how to cope with bereavement but what we believe in our heart and what we're seeing more and more is whatever responses we are making now they they can't depend upon a couple of expert organizations their, their whole societal responses that we need to make and our constant call outs has been has been actually you know the hope is is that we can all make a difference um it may sound corny you know being as a as a reserved englishman sitting here in a suburb but but you know we genuinely can um our differences will be different because we're in different positions but but actually as organizations and as individuals we can all make this difference and it needs to be a whole societal response which is certainly for us what makes it really um encouraging and really sort of exciting in these difficult times being part of this coalition um so so that's me for now just just to in reference to how crews can help uh, how can crews help well we have our national helpline and we have local services that are all remote so um you'll find information on our website about that and there's also lots of information on the website around how to cope in different situations in the context of of the global pandemic and work we're reviewing and renewing that as we go um so thanks and I'll, I'll hand back over thanks andy um uh and yes thank you so much for that um it feels like you really hit on something when you were talking about some of the kind of conversation starters i think there was a lot going on in the chat box at that stage about how how people would really like to hear more about that um and uh, we are working on some resources around that together so thank you everyone for feeding into that and of course um yes i mean the whole societal response um, is, uh, yeah, core to what the Connection Coalition is trying to do and the, and the networks it's trying to build. So thank you for reinforcing the power of that social connection in, in all of your experience um, uh, around what, what good friendship and intervention and connection looks like um, during these difficult times. Um, so I was thinking as you were talking actually Andy, Andy and I first got to know each other a bit um, after Jo was killed and we were looking at different ways to support her friends and family um, and Andy's advice to me during that time was completely invaluable. And now we move on to Susie Phillips who um, works for Winston's Wish who again played a really key role in supporting Joe's two young children um, and we uh, and the family in particular were very lucky to benefit from some of their really brilliant um, and very practical approaches to how to support children particularly through grief and bereavement and loss. So Susie, um, hello, thank you Hi. very much for joining us um, and over to you with your sort of 10 minutes or so. Thank you and thank you so much for hosting today Iona, it's, a, it's great to have everybody together and, um, and, and great to hear from different colleagues um, across the sector. Um, I guess I'd, I'd start by um, echoing a little of what Andy's just talked about and, and, and thinking about the different layers of loss that, that children have already experienced with this pandemic. Um, you know, the, the loss of school and the loss of their usual social interactions with friends. Um, and it, it's interesting because um, teenagers might already be used to keeping in contact with their friends in more remote ways through text and phone calls and emails, but actually for younger children, this is a bit of a new field and 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 some of them are, are perhaps too young to be able to access that and some are able to with the help of their parents but it, it can be really really sporadic um i i guess for for children at the moment um we when we start looking at the evidence again the evidence really varies and because we're also dealing with um bereaved adults in the family as well as bereaved children you know um, as Andy said the the evidence tells us lots and lots of different things about how to support um, these people at this time um, when we think about the children specifically we we 
firstly start by thinking of the level of information that they need to make sense of what's happened. And obviously that, that varies massively um, depending on whether you're working with a five-year-old or a 15-year-old. Um, and we often say to families, think of it a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. And children do need information about what's going on. And that might be information before somebody's died, but, but seriously ill, or it might be um, after somebody's died or a bit of both. Um, but they need information about what's going on. And if children are little, then that information might be one of those big wooden block puzzles that they have where it's like two or three pieces and, and that's it. They might just need to know that somebody's died that's very sad and it means that we we can't see them and talk to them anymore for older children they'll want to understand a little bit more about the context of of somebody dying you know how did they die how does this affect me how does this affect my family and my future possibly um, and that can be really complicated um, and in this time, um, adults are often in control of the level of information that they give to children, but um, COVID is everywhere. It's, um, you know, people are talking about it in the streets, it's on the news. It's very difficult to hide the fact that, um, the, that COVID is here and that people are dying from it. And that we're noticing high levels of anxiety within children at the moment about how it might impact them and their family, particularly if they've had a bereavement in the past, they know that experience of, of losing a parent or a sibling or anybody else important to them, and they're wondering whether it could happen again. Um, so as much as possible, we're encouraging families, um, where appropriate professionals who are still linking in with families to really um, work on reassuring children as much as possible. And part of that is making sure that they're well informed um, uh, up to a point that's age appropriate and, and part of that is also just reminding them about all the people in their lives that are here to help all the um, you know positive things that are going on and there are, are lots of positive things going on as well um, we're also uh, you know again depending on ages and stages children will have a varying degree of understanding about their feelings what we know is that no matter what age children will experience a loss in some way shape or form even a baby whose parent is suddenly gone will experience that as a separation will find it distressing um, but what's different is how that's expressed so um, for um, some children it will be expressed in the way that they're playing in the way that they're behaving for children that have the ability to talk about it they might be able to to verbalize a little bit of what what they're going through but even then um, that that requires a lot of skill to say this is how I'm feeling and it's to do with my grief and as adults we don't always know that so we can't always expect that from children and and like like us as well a lot of the support mechanisms that children would usually use to manage their feelings might not be there you know it's not as easy to go out to the playground at the moment um, they can't um, hang out with their friends um, in the same way, they can't um, go to school and see a variety of people there and play in the playground. So they're having to adapt in the way that adults are to find different ways of, of, of dealing with grief, of dealing with difficult feelings. And that can cre create potentially quite a stressful family environment when there's lots of different people grieving and trying to manage it in different ways. So, um, you know, it, it's as much about everybody trying to be kind to each other, trying to make sense of it, trying to, to help each other as much as possible. Um, and we've noticed that people are learning and adapting and they're finding new ways to link in with people virtually, um, whether that's phone calls or online chats or whatever that might be, um, linking in with friends and family and keeping those connections going, um, linking in with school if possible as well. Um, and um, and reading information if they're old enough to do that is is always really really important. Um, of course, a, a big component for for children, especially younger children, but all children, um, will be keeping to rhythms and routines. And that's another thing that's been interrupted by by COVID by lockdown is that there aren't the usual rhythm and routines of life that they would be used to, and and so that can feel 
um, disconcerting in itself and, and make feel uh, make people feel a little bit unsure of a situation, a little bit confused, a little bit anxious. So again, it's it's helping children to recognise that and find other ways of managing those behaviours. And again, where possible, just giving them opportunities to remember, as we know, and, um, you know, as Poppy's going to talk about more after, is, um, is that we're having to learn to grieve in different ways because it's not possible to, to have the type of funerals that we would usually have to link in with people face to face in the way that we usually would. So, um, so again, for children to try and involve them in, in that process as much as possible is important, but also recognising that they might need to find um, other ways to to remember that person that's died and to, to mark um, their death. Um, again, um, just considering the three principles for approaching um, grief and bereavement specifically for children. Um, I mean, I think it goes without saying that everybody obviously is going to react to um, grief differently and I've certainly had phone calls with families I've spoken to mums where she's saying oh well my my teenager is up in his room not wanting to talk to anyone my um, five-year-old is having tantrums all the time and my eight-year-old has been a superstar and getting on with it and um, and actually they're none of those is right or wrong um, they're, they're all absolutely fine and they're all they all have their challenges in terms of how children make sense of their grief and and learn how to live with that um, but it's important to acknowledge that that is all different I think what what we think about firstly with children is just communication and often people are really worried about talking to children about a death wanting to protect them from that really distressing element even though it is a natural and normal part of life but it it's something that we don't have any control over so just to try and keep in mind that um, it is okay to talk about it, that nothing you can say will make it worse because the worst bit's already happened. That person is already, is already ill or has already died. Um, you also don't need to have all the answers. I think as adults, we also feel that we need to give children answers all the time and make things better. And this is one of those scenarios that that isn't always possible. So it, it sometimes being there to listen is the best thing that you can do and children won't all want to talk about it um, but it's okay to make that offer to them all the same and to and to say do you want to talk and the worst thing they can say is no um, and again just acknowledging their their feelings and what they might be going through um, and and giving them lots of reassurance and taking that seriously as well um, where possible I think it's important to be as honest as possible with with children um, and that's often led by parents so as professionals that, that that's not always something that we can do but um, what we know is that children value being told the truth in in as much as you can given their different ages um, and we know that val children value being given choices in how they are involved with funerals how they are involved with with other grief rituals as well and as we've said before, lots of reassurance about how they can get help and who's here to help them already. Um, and as the cheeky fourth one, I think it's always good to remember self-care for ourselves as professionals and also parents and think and remind them that it's not all about children and their grief. Their grief is so, so important and, and parents need to be thinking about looking after themselves as much as their children. Um, Winston's Wish, um, as you've already mentioned, is a child bereavement charity. So we have a range of services on our website. So we've got a section for school. We've got a section for professionals, parents, children and young people themselves. So we've got lots of specific information related to dealing with grief in the current climate in this pandemic. Um, so do log on and have a look at that. We've also got our national free phone helpline that's for parents and professionals and live chat and email that's for anybody. So um, all of our face-to-face -face services have been adapted into digital services. So we are still offering support to families just through different means as many people are at the moment. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susie. That was so rich um, and yeah, really, really helpful to hear. Um, uh, 
interesting that uh, some of the things that children need are the things that adults need uh, yes. as, a, <laughs> as a woman living on her own uh, dearly in need of a conversation to discuss lots of things uh, including loss um, so yeah on a serious note thank you very much for sharing that and um, all of that wisdom um, so now we have the wonderful Poppy Mardle who um, uh, is the, the uh, CEO and founder of Poppy's Funerals um, and as I said earlier, it is her birthday, um, which I'd feel very guilty about. But actually, she loves nothing more than talking about how to remember and memorialize and celebrate life as much as mourn death and loss. So I don't feel too guilty about having dragged her on here, although a tiny bit guilty. Um, so Poppy, over to you um, to share a bit about um, what you're seeing is working uh, to kind of help people come together and sort of remember people despite all of the restrictions we're currently experiencing because of uh, physical distancing. So yeah, Poppy, over to you. Thanks, Iona, and thank you for my birthday wishes. You're right. Um, Iona actually said to me, I don't think you'll want to do this because it's your birthday. And I said, oh, I would love to do this on my birthday. So thank you all for having me. Um, and thank you so much, Susie and Andy, for everything that's come before. It's, I've been typing notes to share with my team. Um, so what does the evidence tell us about why coming together and connecting is good for us during grief? Um, well, there's not a lot of hard data on funerals. And I think that says a lot about how as a society we have probably like slightly lost our way um, in terms of rituals, but I won't go into that in detail now. But what I can talk about is the kind of rich experience that I have gathered over the last eight years and particularly over the last couple of months. Um, looking at the impact of how restrictions are both causing real pain, but also generating sort of deep creativity. Um, and my experience over the last eight years of running Poppies is that grief is hugely impacted by the hours and days around dying and death and the things that happened during that time. So... Um, did the family and friends even know the person was dying? We've had really, really interesting conversations with co colleagues at local hospices over the years um, about the challenge that they face in a society that is quite death denying in trying to help people understand that death is taking place. And they report circumstances where, you know, um, families they have had discussions with families that death is happening but somehow the information hasn't got through and i that that prompted that thought was prompted hugely by um andy talking about this idea of like the brain and what the brain can take in um what what is the experience that the person is ha having around the death and what happened next did the person who died die in a hospital if they died in a hospital was it in an intensive care ward or was it supported by palliative care experts did the person who died die at home or in a hospice? Was the death expected or was it a shock? Was the death calm or was it scary? Um, and then how were families, family and friends supported in the, in the hours and days after the death? Most importantly, by their community of friends, family and neighbours, but also by bereavement officers and the register office and the coroner and funeral directors. Did everyone from, from family and friends to funeral directors play their role to support and facilitate people doing, saying, having the experiences they, they need and want. During COVID-19, this is a particularly difficult challenge because um, as we know, and as we've discussed, people are physically separate from each other and there's nothing like someone crying in front of you to um, cause you to wrap your arms around them. But if people are crying in different houses, how do you, how do you know how to respond um, and then and then in the sector you know I've watched lots of new processes be brought in um, good processes responsible processes almost all designed to serve infection control you know we've seen obviously in hospitals um, lots of circumstances where people have not been able to be by the person's side when the death takes place well that extends beyond so so we see hospital mortuaries who would usually be able to facilitate families spending time with the person who's died having to restrict that 
service and we have funeral director colleagues who feel that they've had to bring in policies whereby if someone died with COVID-19 the family can't come and visit um, so we're facing circumstances where the family weren't able to be by the person's side while they were dying they weren't able to see the person after they died in the hospital and then potentially can't be facilitated to do that with the funeral director either um, recognizing that for lots of people seeing that death is happening has happened is part of our brains even be, being able to conceive in those early stages that the death has occurred so we have lots of reports from families and i've had that experience personally you know that that seeing the person has died seeing the dead body it's the first step of realizing like shit this thing has happened um and then the reality of people not being able to come to the funeral. So in practice, um, there, there is no specific number issued by the government on how many people can attend a funeral, but it's being interpreted on the ground usually as about 10. Um, so that's, that's, that's a pretty small number. Funerals are definitely totally, they're serving different purposes right now. Um, and just thinking a little bit about like, what, what does a funeral do? And therefore, what are, we, what are we losing right now with restricted funerals? It's, it's a moment of shared reality. So we stand in a room together and we, we particularly have the person who died with us in a coffin and we all look on in disbelief to try and stretch our brains around what's happened. We critically see that everyone else is devastated. We're watching other people cry, which gives us critical permission to be devastated. Um, funerals really importantly stir up past experiences for us you know it's very common to be at a funeral crying about someone who died 10 years ago it's a it's like a portal into that part of our consciousness um, funerals are a time to recall really powerful memories so it may well be the first time in our lives that we've thought about that life in in its in its entirety it's very common when someone dies for us to think about when they were small and and when they were teenagers and when they were in their 20s um, we it's very normal for us to talk to each other about the whole life you know we will share those memories amongst families and friends and in our communities we look at photos in planning for the funeral we'll often play their favorite music to figure out what it is we want to play we might choose a favorite outfit for them to wear in their coffin we we come together as families um, I, I think of it as a kind of are rolling around in the essence of the person you know it's kind of like a critical balm um, and then at the funeral itself we remember or, or may perhaps realize for the first time how how much and how strongly other people feel about the person who died we realize the feelings we're having are shared with others um, really practically it's not it's an opportunity to activate support so if you gather together 50 or 60 or 100 people suddenly those people are in the mindset of you know, I would like to help you. I would like to cook something or I would like, I'm going to remember to give you a call in a month's time. Um, it's a really important opportunity to try and make meaning of what's happened. Um, and perhaps most importantly, it's a kind of public ritual to acknowledge the change that has taken place on the planet. Like none of us are going to be the same again. Now this person has died. So in terms of how much of that is possible and how much of that is being restricted by the reality of funerals right now, I'd say the first message is quite reassuring. So um, the clients that get in contact with us are pretty afraid, I think, of, of, of trying to organize this thing during this time. Um, but across the board, I'd say the reports that we, we're getting are that people are feeling that the experiences they're having are surprisingly meaningful. You know, I think, there are some of us, and I would count myself in this group, who secretly would love to have a funeral with 10 people because then we could really experience it for ourselves rather than feel that we need to put on an event for others. You know, it's not good for all the people that can't come, but it might be particularly, it might do something particular for, for the intimate group that are able to gather. Um, our own head of operations, Isabel, her mum died at the beginning of this um, outbreak, not, not of COVID-19, but a funeral that was meant to be you know, 200 people turned out to be just Isabella, her husband, her two small children and her dad. And um, it was heartbreaking for her not to be able to do the things she'd been planning. But 
she's written really powerfully about what she got from it that she wasn't expecting. So I think that's, and that, that isn't that a kind of wider message of what we're all feeling during this time. Lots of loss and lots of unexpected opportunity. Um, it's also really hard. So we're watching families have to make decisions about who can and can't come. We have had a family this week where, you know, there are 16 direct members of the family. So that's four children and then I guess 12 grandchildren. Um, so even without partners coming, 16 is too many. And we've been able to find a crematorium that will accept 15, which means they've had to try and find childcare for, this, for, for the two-year-old that is the one that, you know, can't be included. So, and I think acknowledging how for a family at such a critical time, such a rite of passage, that can feel like an act of unkindness. That can feel like a real sense of kind of computer says no, although the restrictions are really important and we need to abide by them. When you're in that moment, you know, it can feel like I don't care about COVID-19. I don't care about social distancing. Like my mum has just died and we need to do what we need to do. So, you know, we're, we're trying to handle that right now. It's not easy. Um, I think one of the things I'm, I'm seeing is like, and this is a very reassuring message, I think is like ritual will out. You know, we might think that we don't need ritual anymore and we've, and we've certainly um, ditched a lot of ritual and, and lots of that ritual wasn't serving us. So it's, it's worth ditching ritual that isn't serving us. But we are seeing people do amazing things. So we've seen families stream, you probably read about that, but stream funerals to, to everyone who can't be there. So it's quite common for crematoria and cemeteries to have streaming services that can connect lots of people. Um, some people are having like separate online ce ceremonies led by a minister or a celebrant or, or just led by the family, um, sending out like e-orders of service at, a, at an agreed time. Um, we're seeing people think that that's too much work. So they're just kind of agreeing on a time where everyone will light a candle and um, hold each other in thought and be together in heart and mind. And um, we've had people who were at the funeral just like write a summary for everybody who couldn't be there. We had a funeral where the names of everybody who couldn't be there were read out. Um, I'm on my, I'm sort of on my like three, my three points now. Point two is, you know, there are lots of acts of creativity that can connect us with the person who died. Cooking, the, cooking someone's favorite meal or um, writing a letter to go in the coffin. Um, and then the third way, which is not, it's not ideal, but lots of people are doing it, is, is planning a memorial as something to look forward to. So, so there, is, there, is, there is a day where you will have the experience that you wanted and needed to have. It won't be quite what you anticipated, but it is a time. There will come a time where we can all be together and we can remember together this person's life. Um, and in the meantime, you know, I've done this personally in my life, like putting up photos, making a little altar like I'm not a religious person but but I have made a little kind of altar in my house with photos of the person who's died and, and stuff that makes me feel close to them. In terms of how we can help um, I think probably re realistically the most useful thing we can do is is pump out information and that's what we do so we have a blog called Talking Death um, where we share information about what's possible um, and report from kind of the front line of death and dying um, next week with Dying Matters Week, we're holding some open days um, where I will be hosting some kind of tour and introducing people to my colleagues and they will be talking through the work they do. And, and the point of that is very much to kind of reassure people that there is kind of deep humanity happening behind the scenes. And for us, this is not a, this is not a problem. This is not a kind of logistical problem. This is a kind of really important um, moment that we want to do we want to use all of our power and all of our experience to help kind of facilitate so i think yeah i think that's everything from me thank you very much poppy um uh yeah super uh useful and interesting to hear some of the things that you you and your team are, are seeing people finding meaningful um and um Yes, for, for the introverts among us, I imagine the idea of having a funeral of 10 people is um, definitely perhaps uh, more appealing than something larger. So I can definitely see, yeah, how there's no one size fits all for this current moment on any level. And so thank you for the kind of diversity of all the things you were drawing on there. Um, so we now have 
Toby, who works for Hospice UK um, and runs a campaign called Dying Matters, of which there is an awareness week next week. Um, and uh, Toby, we'd love to hear a bit about what the plans are um, and how people might be able to support or get involved in, uh, in the plans that you have in the pipeline. Grand, well, thank you very much, and hello, everybody. Um, I'm aware we're, we're slightly over time, so I'll try and keep this brief. So Dying Matters Awareness Week has been running since 2010, and normally we would be expecting to have hundreds of events taking place around the country where people are getting together, whether that's a death cafe or other discussion spaces, art, film showings. As Poppy indicated, things like behind-the-scenes tours at funeral directors, crematoria, those sorts of things, all really, really popular. Obviously, this year, none of that stuff is happening that we'd normally expect, but we've got a lot of things happening um, online, as, as Poppy again indicated a moment ago. So people are still doing online death cafes. They are doing, um, we had a, 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 a stream of a theatre performance about death that was on the other night that's available online. People are doing discussion groups. They're doing information things. Um, so there's less happening and it's happening online rather than face to face. But I'm still really pleased that a lot is taking place and that people are still getting behind it. The goal of Dying Matters has always been to encourage people to feel comfortable talking about dying, death and grief. But obviously, we've talked a lot about grief this morning. and There's been some fantastic stuff um, shared, which is just wonderful to, to hear all the stuff that's going on and the research um, that we're learning from this. Um, we've always wanted people to do some practical things want to think about their funeral plans to think about the end of life care they'd like to receive to make their will up to date to decide on organ donation whether they want to opt in or out and obviously the law is changing but you still get to choose and above all to write this stuff down and tell other people who need to know it where they can find it because there's no point making these decisions um and it being unearthed in a pile of your papers two years later. That's, that's no use to anyone at all. So now some of that obviously is affected by this. You might have the most ambitious funeral plan and have fully costed and worked out how it's going to be paid for and everything. But under the current circumstances, you aren't going to get the thing you, you, you wished for. So there's a lot of stuff about further down the line about how we maybe people who are dying now and who wanted a big send off, but don't get it now, how that's caught up with later so to speak how we make that happen we will be issuing well we have issued a press release that will be uh, released from its embargo on monday we've done some original research and there's two we did two sort of stages of research this because the theme for this year is called dying to be heard and our, our strap plan has always been let's talk about it but the thing we want to focus on this year is great we want people to talk about dying death and grief but that obliges someone else to be willing to listen and so what we're saying is any one person may or may not at a particular point in time be willing to initiate their own conversation about dying, death or grief. But we all of us need to be willing, wherever possible, to at least listen when someone else wants to talk to us about death or grief. It's too easy to brush it off with a joke or say, oh, can we do this later? Or I'm not really in the mood. But actually, it might have taken that person a long time to get to the point where they're ready to talk. And if we squash it, they might not come back for weeks or years or possibly ever. So it's called Dying to be Heard, and it's about our obligations to listen and just to be part of the conversation. You don't need to be an expert. We've got some very good leaflets online to help you get started, just how to listen. And the practical information you need is all signposted through the Dying Matters site. So you don't need to be expert. You just need to be able to find the, the Dying Matters website. So we want people to be listening. And we found from the survey that we did earlier this year, we did some opinion poll serving, that actually people who are bereaved, looking back on that experience, found that having someone to talk to, someone willing to listen to them, was one of the top three most useful things that helped them get through the, the first stage of bereavement. Now, you never stop grieving. It's something you learn to live with. So we're not suggesting, as was indicated right at the start, that grief is something that happens over a couple of weeks and then stops and you should be able to pass it away. We recognise it goes on for a long time, and that's why we're grateful for, for people like Winston's Wish and Cruz doing fantastic work. But having someone who's willing to listen is an important part for people, and we know that. We've also done some further research um, after the outbreak started, and one of the things that came out of that was that um, roughly half of people, I think 48, 49% of people, felt that not being able to attend a funeral or not being able to make what they would expect to be the final visit to someone they knew was dying 
he's gonna it makes it really hard some people said they made it feel angry about half of people said they made it feel hard to believe that person was really dead if you haven't had the send-off the funeral or the chance to say goodbye so as a society we are gonna have to find ways to accommodate this stuff as hopefully soon enough we get this virus behind us and start to return to something like normality there is as people have already touched on earlier in this conversation there is something that needs to be done to help us express our feelings around the people who have died during this period and we haven't been able to express them normally so dying matters awareness week it's a week when we try to get a lot of focus but the stuff happens year round obviously a lot of things having to be cancelled for next week we're hoping those cancellations will turn out to be postponements so people will do things in the autumn I'm grateful to everyone who's doing everything. Um, they're really putting the effort. We've got wonderful new leaflets for this, year's, for this year, which are free to download. You'll find it all on the Dying Matters website. So it's easy to put something on. If you just want to host an online conversation of your particular area of expertise, then just do it. If you register it on our website, it makes it even better because we can then share it with other people. But the main thing is just to be getting out there and helping the conversations happen wherever they can. They bubble up in all sorts of places. Some of them are formally organized. Some of the things that just happen. And what we want is people to pledge, to commit, to take part in that conversation when it happens. If we can get that done, then that is part of the structure that will help us deal with the, the, the fallout from this virus and all the deaths that happen anyway during this period over the weeks and months and years to come. Because this is going to be a big issue for, for society to get through and we can only get through it if we are more comfortable talking about death we know from our poly in the past most people say about two-thirds of people say oh i'm comfortable talking about death and dying but three quarters of people think other people aren't so it's not me it's you and so what we're trying to flip around for this just say look we know people want to talk let's be part of that conversation there are people dying to be heard let's listen Thank you very much, Toby. I think that's a really interesting insight, that final one there about um, how we assume it's everyone else and not ourselves that's the thing at stake. And as someone who's worked, as lots of you have, I imagine, on this call too, on sort of issues around social integration and cohesion, we consistently see that in um, kind of community relations. So, um, yes, um, if, if ever that was proof of the fact that if we can get even something right now in the way we talk about um, the kind of loss and grief we're all experiencing will be laying the foundations uh, for a uh, definitely more connected and um, open kind of community environment at the end of this crisis and into the future.